<clears throat> one of the questions I get all the time is, people ask, why does an AC freeze? And I've heard a lot of, lot of different explanations over the time. Uh, some of them are good and accurate, and some of them are missing information, and some of them are just completely false. So today, we're going to talk about why does an AC freeze. Now, for any technician, any guy in school, you're going to be asked, why does an AC freeze? It's one of those things you should be able to know why it's freezing and what to look for. So why does an AC freeze? A lot of people um, say, well, that has to be a simple answer. Sure, there's a simple answer. Why does an AC freeze? Simplest answer, saturation temperature below 32 degrees. So why does an AC freeze? The saturated temperature is below 32 degrees Fahrenheit. So saturated means where there's liquid and vapor both exist. Uh, it's where pressure, PSIG, is converted to temperature. Uh, it's where you have a change of state, latent heat. We have boiling or evaporation or condensing. So in the suction side, we have low pressure. We're going to have a lower saturation temperature. So here this represents our evaporator coil. Coming out of the metering device, we immediately have a pressure drop. So we're going to have a temperature drop. When that temperature drops and pressure drops, our saturation also drops. When that saturated temperature coming out of the metering device drops below 32 degrees Fahrenheit, the moisture from the air is going to freeze on that evaporator coil, and the system is going to freeze up. It's going to start from the evaporator coil and start freezing its way all the way back towards the compressor. So that is why AC will freeze. The saturated temperature is below 32 degrees Fahrenheit. That is the reason. Now there's four categories that cause this to happen. So the first and most likely category, the first when you think an AC is freezing up, the first thing you should check, without anything else, the first thing you should immediately think of is airflow. So the number one reason the saturation temperature falls below 32 is airflow. Airflow. Now this is a huge category. There's a lot of stuff to consider with airflow. So our evaporator coil is absorbing heat out of the air. So as that air is coming through there, there's heat in the air. And um, if I block the airflow, I have less heat that's reacting inside that evaporator coil. Since there's less heat acting against that evaporator coil, I'm going to have a pressure drop. And when there's a pressure drop, there's also going to be a saturation temperature drop. And when the saturation temperature drops below 32, the evaporator coil will start to freeze. And now as it's freezing, the ice on the evaporator coil that's freezing is now restricting more airflow which is causing a lower pressure drop, a lower saturation temperature drop, which causes it to freeze faster and faster and faster until finally the whole entire cool is frozen and it starts freezing its way all the way back to the compressor. So airflow. Now if we think about airflow being, being blocked, there's a huge category for this. Most common thing when you have a system freezing for airflow is a dirty filter. So if the filter gets dirty, I'm restricting the air that's coming into that evaporator cool inside. And if I'm restricting the air coming in, I'm restricting the heat coming in to make that refrigerant boil. As I restrict the heat for that refrigerant to boil, uh, I drop the pressure. When the pressure drops, the saturation temperature drops. And when the saturation temperature drops below 32, the unit will freeze. So there's a lot of things with airflow. Let's also think about uh, if the return air duct is too small. We can't get enough air into it. The filter is dirty. We can't get enough air through it or a combination of. Let's say maybe the customer shut off too many of the supply vents. So the supply registers close down. The unit not only can't pull enough air, but it can't push enough air out. So if we're not getting enough airflow across the evaporator coil, temperature drops, pressure drops, pressure drops, saturation temperature drops. Also, we've got to think about our evaporator coil itself. Uh, let's say we have a customer that has a filter that doesn't restrict airflow, and all that dirt gets hung up right on the evaporator coil. So all that dirt hits the evaporator coil, and the evaporator coil itself starts to clog up. And that evaporator coil clogs up, uh, it's an airflow restriction, and also causes it to freeze. This evaporator coil, though, is not just with it being clogged up with dirt, but dirt's a good insulator. So you get dirt on these fins. These fins don't transfer heat to the air. And even though the air is still warm, the, it's absorbing the heat out of that dirt and dust and hair, and the system will start to freeze. So airflow, airflow, airflow. Now we can keep going further down this, down this rabbit hole if we think about it. What about if a customer pushes a couch up in front of the return air grill and that blocks airflow? Think about the blower motor. Maybe the blower motor is in too low of a speed. It's not moving enough air across that evaporator coil. Or maybe the capacitor for the blower motor is bad and it's not moving enough airflow. Maybe the blower motor itself is out. Maybe somebody put the wrong fan wheel in. Maybe somebody put the cutoff plate on the blower wheel in the wrong spot and it's not moving enough air. Maybe the um, 
Maybe the fan relay that controls the blower motor is out. Maybe there's a problem with the, the G control wire that's making that fan motor not come on at all. Maybe the thermostat and everything inside cycling fine, but the compressor contactor that controls the outside unit has welded itself shut. So even though the inside unit cycles off, the compressor outside stays on pumping refrigerant. We're pumping refrigerant, but there's no airflow across the evaporator coil, so the system will freeze. So anytime we have a pressure drop, our saturation is going to drop, and it's going to freeze. And there's a whole list of things. Anything you can possibly think of with not getting enough airflow across that evaporator coil, it's going to cause it to freeze. So when you see a system freezing, the first thing that's been in your mind, you need to check airflow. There's, that's your first thing you need to eliminate. Your second most likely cause, number two, is refrigerant. If we're low on refrigerant, low in refrigerant, we don't have enough volume in the system. So there's not enough volume in the system, there's not enough molecules of refrigerant, my compressor can't build high pressure. So if we don't have enough high pressure on this side, then as we come to the meter device, we drop the pressure even lower, and I didn't have enough pressure to begin with, now I have a pressure drop. And when our pressure drops, our saturation temperature also drops. And when our saturation temperature drops below 32, the system will freeze. So, low on refrigerant. What about, um, what would cause it to be low on refrigerant? There's only one real cause it's going to be low on refrigerant, and that's a refrigerant leak. Nobody likes to look for a refrigerant leak, we don't like to find the leak, we don't like to fix the leak, but it's essential, it's part of your job. You need to know where it's leaking. It doesn't wear out, it doesn't magically disappear. There's a reason that you're low in refrigerant. And if you're low in refrigerant, you don't just add refrigerant. You need to find the leak and fix the leak. So we need to find where the leak's going on and solve that issue. So one of the things we want to do, if we're low in refrigerant, that means we need to find the leak. Find the leak and fix that leak. Another misconception is people all the time think, <clears throat> well, what about if it's overcharged? Does that cause it to freeze? And no. The answer is no. The reason is, if I add more refrigerant than there should be in here, then that means I have more molecules of refrigerant in this high side. That means if I have more molecules of refrigerant, my compressor is still trying to pump the same volume, there's more refrigerant there, my pressure on this side is going to go up. So as I have more refrigerant, the pressure goes up. So that means I have more pressure on the outside unit, higher pressure. There's a lot of pressure pushing against this liquid. Now I have more liquid, more refrigerant flowing into the evaporator coil, and that means I have higher pressure in the evaporator coil. When the pressure goes up, the saturated temperature, the boiling temperature, the evaporation temperature, condensing temperature, all these go up. So as my pressure goes up, my saturation goes up, which means it's going to be going farther and farther away from 32. So adding refrigerant to a system uh, will cause these pressures to go up, and a lot of times you'll have a customer with an airflow problem, and the technician added refrigerant to solve that problem. Now you have two problems. You still have the airflow problem, but you've flooded your evaporator coil with liquid refrigerant, and now you're going to be getting liquid refrigerant on its way back to the compressor. We don't want that to happen because any superheat less than five is going to kill the compressor. So a lot of people overcharge units with refrigerant, trying to solve an airflow problem, thinking it's a refrigerant problem. An overcharged unit will not freeze, and that's a problem because people add refrigerant to solve an airflow issue, even though it's a refrigerant issue. So number one cause, airflow. Number two cause, there's a leak. It's low in refrigerant, but we know if it's low in refrigerant that much, it's going to be a leak. Most systems across America, overcharged. It's not magical juice that makes cooling. It's not antifreeze, it's not coolant, it's refrigerant. The refrigerant has a changed state from a liquid to vapor to absorb massive amounts of BTU. We have to condense it from a vapor back to a liquid to reject massive amounts of BTU. Lots of refrigerants do these jobs. There's a refrigerant enthalpy chart that you can track all this on, but that's not today's topic. So number one, airflow. Number two, low in refrigerant, find the leak. Number three, most likely cause, and this is easy and quick to identify, is temperature, low temperature. Low temperature. So let's say the indoor temperature is 70, uh, say 78 degrees Fahrenheit, and my evaporator coil is at 40 degrees Fahrenheit. There's a temperature difference, so there will be heat transfer. Let's say uh, I drop this temperature, though, down 
from 78 degrees, and I drop that temperature down to 70 degrees Fahrenheit. That's an eight degree temperature drop. So if I drop my evaporator coil eight degrees also to, to follow that, 40 minus eight, what are we at? 32 degrees Fahrenheit. So as the indoor temperature of the house starts to drop, my saturation temperature on my evaporator coil also drops. Once it drops below 32, the system will freeze. No AC system should be set below 70. If you have a system or a reason or a commercial building where it has to operate below 70, in that case, you need to add some components for this to operate correctly. Low ambient kits, uh, accumulators, hot gas bypass in some scenarios, uh, crankcase pressure rate. There's a lot of things you can do to solve that issue, but a standard AC shouldn't be operating below 70 degrees, uh, which is a whole other topic. You can put a freeze stat in here, to where if it gets at 32 degrees, it shuts the compressor off and leaves the fan on. So the fan is actually dethawing any ice that may have collected, and the outside unit cycles on and off as you need. Freeze stats work really great to help solve a customer that you have that they're setting their thermostat at, say, 68, and it's freezing up, trying to explain to that customer about they're setting the thermostat too low is not a conversation that's going to go well. Now, it's something that we need to explain to the customer for sure, but an easier scenario is, hey, we're going to put a free stat on here that will prevent that thing from freezing. And it just simply breaks the wire wire to the outdoor unit. The inside will still cycle like it's supposed to. The customer will never even know there's an issue. The fan stays on. They're still cooling in their house the whole time. It just prevents it from freezing. Also, though, an overlooked side is if the outdoor temperature drops too low. And this is a real important time, let's say, around Christmas or Thanksgiving, when you have a lot of people over in the house and the heat load of the house goes up and there's cooking, there's boiling water, there's latent heat, there's people sweating, there's latent heat, there's a lot more body heat in the house. The temperature of the house can go up, even though outside, you look outside and there's maybe uh, even snow on the ground, it's really cool outside. Now, at one point in time in America, we'd see wow, it's warm inside and it's cool outside, we'd open windows and second law of thermodynamics, the heat from inside is going to travel outside and you're going to have uh, natural convection happening and it's, the house is going to cool down. But so many people now have grown up with air conditioning, that's not their first thought. Their first thought is, I'm going to turn the air conditioner on, spend money to make this, to force this to happen. So let's talk about why that would cause it to freeze. The outdoor temperature drops. What's going to happen to the outdoor pressure? It's going to drop. So as the outdoor temperature drops, the outdoor pressure drops. There's less pressure pushing the refrigerant. If there's less pressure pushing this refrigerant through the metering device, then that means I also have a pressure drop on my evaporator coil. And if my pressure drops, what happens to my saturation temperature? It also drops. When my saturation temperature drops below 32, the system will freeze. That's exactly right. So as the outdoor temperature drops, the pressure drops, that's going to affect the pressure of my inside unit, and it will freeze. I love to walk around um, down the street, especially uh, multifamily homes, around uh, complexes around Christmas and Thanksgiving, and see how many of these suction lines to the outdoor unit are just a big solid ball of ice. Because they turn them on, it cools for a little bit until it starts to freeze, and then once it starts freezing, now you're blocking airflow, freezing faster, freezing faster. This becomes a block of ice, and it freezes all the way back to the compressor. And instead of it being Willis's carrier air conditioner to cool and dehumidify, it turns into John Gorey's invention, the ice machine. Uh, and ice, air doesn't flow well through ice. So uh, that's an issue. Now there is solutions for this. The free stat inside will help, but there's also a low ambient kit we can install. And what we can do is it's a fan cycle switch. So as the outdoor pressure drops too low, it can shut the fan motor off, then the pressure will build back up and keep the pressure high enough feeding the metering device. If the pressure gets to a certain point, the fan motor comes back on, so the fan is cycling on and off to maintain a head pressure. You see these in commercial buildings, especially like uh, airports. They need these because they need to have cooling when the temperature is low outside. So you can't open a window in an airport. <laughs> Anyways, um, if you do that with these fans, a lot of times you have to make sure you have bearing uh, fan motors because that on and off can wear out the sleeves, possibly. All right, so number one reason to think airflow. Next, refrigerant leak, and then also the issue of the temperature inside too low or the temperature outside too low. And that's easy to identify. If you have a jacket on walking in, temperature outside is probably too low. Uh, if you have a jacket while you're inside, temperature is probably too low. But if you see it below 70 degrees, there should be a red flag in your mind, something's going on. And the last reason. Still an important reason, but you don't see it as often, but still very, very, very important is a refrigerant restriction. 
And this is the mechanical restriction in the refrigeration cycle. So anything in this cycle that would have a problem uh, would cause this. For example, let's say my metering device got clogged up. It should have a pressure drop here, but if it gets clogged up, it's going to have too much of a pressure drop. And if my pressure drops too low, what's going to happen to my pressure on the evaporator? As it drops, my saturation temperature drops. Once the saturation temperature drops below 32 degrees Fahrenheit, the evaporator coil will start to freeze. So these metering devices get clogged up. Why does the metering device get clogged up? A lot of times when people are installing the system, they didn't flush the lines, they didn't clean the lines. Um, also, people a lot of times don't braze with nitrogen. If you don't braze with nitrogen, you end up with oxidation. Oxidation fills up through the lines and they get hung up in things like the metering device. Thermostatic expansion valves can, uh, can become faulty. Biggest cause of a uh, thermostatic expansion valve to fail is because when they were brazing it in, they overheated the valve or they overheated where the sensing bulb is and caused an issue. Uh, there's sometimes a screen before these metering devices. That screen can become clogged up or dirty. That can cause a pressure drop. Also, you should have a liquid line filter dryer. Uh, in my day, we always installed our liquid line filter dryers before the metering device to protect them. Now, a lot of them you see outside, so I draw my liquid line filter dryer in the middle because as long as it's on that liquid line, uh, ideally you're, you're still protected. Although the closer it is to that metering device, the better protected you are. But if this filter dryer gets clogged up, say too much moisture, uh, same scenario, all that stuff, all that junk in the systems, oxidation, carbon buildup, anything in there clogs up this metering device, you're going to have a pressure drop across that metering device. So we have lower pressure coming out of the metering device. I'm sorry. We have lower pressure coming out of the liquid line filter dryer. And if I have a pressure drop across my liquid line filter dryer, and then I hit my metering device, which causes another pressure drop, my pressure drops too low. When my pressure drops too low, my saturation temperature drops below 32, the system will freeze. So this liquid line filter dryer right here, we want to inspect that to make sure there's not a uh, pressure drop. And there's usually only a service port on one side of this, so how can you check to see if your liquid line filter dryer is good or bad? By temperature. If I get the temperature on this side and the temperature on this side, they should be the same temperature. If there's a temperature change from this side to this side, there's also a pressure change. So if I have a temperature drop across this liquid line filter dryer, there's a pressure drop, and a pressure drop's not good. I don't, I want uh, like a one degree pressure drop, you know, two degree, maybe three degree. I've heard people be okay with it. Three degrees, I'm like, hey, we're changing it. Uh, I've heard some people say five degrees, they don't worry about it until you have a five degree pressure uh, temperature drop. To me, a five degree temperature drop is significant. That's clogged up, it's maxed out, we need to replace that. So. Uh, Whatever your employer says, that's what you go with. But you check this with a the thermometer on each side. It should be the same temperature. So that can be a problem. Uh, let's see the service valve. Somebody had the valve. They didn't open it up all the way. We had a pressure drop. We hit the metering device. Another pressure drop. Pressure drop. Saturation temperature drops. Below 32, it will freeze. Um, I've seen people put liquid line filter dryers here on the hot gas line. And uh, when that happens, it comes apart. And those little BBs inside the and desiccant material inside the liquid line filter dryer gets clogged up inside the condensing unit, causes a pressure drop, pressure drop, another pressure drop here, it freezes, kinks in the line. People run their refrigerant lines in the wall and as they try to bend it, they kink the line. Sometimes they can't see it. They don't know that they did it, but this line becomes kinked. So think of a straw. If you kink a straw, you're not gonna get as much flow through that straw. So as we have a kink anywhere in this line, we're gonna have a pressure drop on that line. As the pressure drops, our saturation temperature will also drop. A quick way to check for a kink in the wall is on one side where it goes into the wall. It should be pretty close to that same temperature coming out the other side of the wall, depending on the length of the wall and how insulated it is. But if you have a significant temperature drop, you know you have a kink in that line. Or anything else you can possibly think of, any other component in this line that's between this side of the unit and this side of the unit that could possibly be clogged up the cause of pressure drop. That would cause your pressure drop on across your metering device, which is going to cause the unit to freeze. So airflow, it's freezing up, saturated temperature below 32, immediately be thinking airflow. Eliminate that first. <clears throat> After you dethaw it, you're going to be able to check the refrigerant charge, superheat and subcooling. If it's a TXV, you're going to focus more on subcooling, but you're still going to check superheat. You need to know if it's doing its job right. If it's a fixed orifice, you're going to do, you're going to focus more on superheat. You're going to find your target superheat, indoor wet bulb, outdoor dry bulb, and the formula or the chart or the app. 
Uh, and then you also still want to check subcooling and see what's happening with your subcooling. You still want to know what's happening on both sides. It's not just superheat, it's not just subcooling. Check the refrigerant charge. If it's low in charge, you have a leak. Also, uh, temperature inside or outside too low, it's quick to identify. There's solutions for those. And refrigerant restriction, you can usually find those with a thermometer. So those are the reasons why an AC freezes. You should know those. Those should be in your mind. And if somebody asks you and you start explaining that, they should realize, wow, there's a lot to this. Can you come out and check it? And that's the, what we're trying to get to because it's not just an appliance. It's not just a part. This whole system has to work together in a cycle. Proper airflow here, proper airflow there. It's very, very important. Uh, on that same note, let me give you a little note of advice. Last year, you're going to a customer's house and you're doing maintenance. And you're doing maintenance, you check the evaporator coil, and you notice that the evaporator coil, when you look up inside, this has a lot of dirt on it. It's clogged up, it's dirty. It's going to be an airflow restriction. And you think, wow, that needs to be cleaned, but that's going to be an extra charge. You go out and look at the outside unit, and the outside unit is also dirty. Well, part of your maintenance is you clean the outside unit. Don't. If your inside unit's clogged up, don't clean the outside unit because it's going to be a problem. And here's why. If this outside, if the inside unit's dirty, I'm going to have a pressure drop, right? My pressure drops, my saturation temperature drops. When my saturation temperature drops below 32, it will freeze. But if it's dirty on the outside, if I have dirt in the outside, it's going to be the opposite effect. If it's dirty on the outside, what's going to happen to the pressure on the outside unit as it's not cooling the refrigerant? If I have an airflow restriction on here, it's, or it's dirt or anything happening here, it's going to cause the pressure to go up. So a higher pressure here means I'm ending up with more pressure on this side. Now, it's still not operating correctly, but the higher pressure over there is keeping this pressure up, and it may be just enough to keep this pressure above 32 to keep it from freezing. But if you leave this one dirty, and then you go and do your job and you wash this system out and make this working like it's supposed to, this pressure drops to where it's supposed to be. Now this pressure over here is going to drop, but because there's an airflow restriction, now the unit will start to freeze. So the customer looks at you and thinking, what did you do? It wasn't freezing before you came, and now it's freezing. This happened to me when I was a young guy in the field. I had the system, I knew the inside needed to be cleaned, they didn't want to clean it yet, well, I said to do my job of washing the outside unit, but now that I washed the outside unit, the inside unit started freezing up, and before I understood how all this worked, it was a big issue, and we ended up doing a evaporator cool clean for free for the customer because we had to solve that issue. Don't get into that problem. If you have a dirty evaporator coil, that needs to be cleaned at the same time you're cleaning the outside coil. So hopefully that'll save you an issue. So why is an AC freeze? Saturated temperature below 32. Uh, number one cause airflow. Number two cause low refrigerant. Find the leak. Uh, inside or outside temperature too low and refrigerant refrigeration cycle restriction. Keep those in your mind all the time and you'll be able to solve any of those issues. And it could also be a combination of any of those. Uh, one day you may have it to where you have an airflow restriction, not too bad, but now the outdoor temperature drops a little bit, boom, starts to freeze. Or maybe you have an airflow restriction from ductwork, and now you have a little bit of a dirty filter, and it starts to freeze. Or any possible combination you can think of. Um, hope that helps. Have a great day.